In chapter nine, you'll learn about the floating point unit on the LM4F 120 H5QR. All of TI's M4 devices are equipped with a floating point unit, although for code compatibility reasons, it's switched off at reset. You'll learn about the basics of floating point numbers and how the LM4F devices implement them. What is floating point? Floating point is a way to represent real numbers on computers. There are several IEEE floating point formats, the half precision at 16 bit, single precision at 32 bits, double precision at 64 bits, and quadruple at 128 bits. IEEE 754 is single precision, that's the 32 bit version there, a sign bit, 8 bits of exponent, and 23 bits of fraction. IEEE 754 defines a single precision floating point representation like we just saw on the previous page. For example, right, there's the sign bit, the exponent, and then there's the, uh, there's the uh, fractional uh, representation. So if we take this value, here's the minus one, the value equals minus one to the zero. So that's, that's a zero there. Um, we can see that the next portion is the, uh, is the um, um, fraction, uh, the mantissa. And then the next part is two to the whatever number that we have there, 134 minus 127. Calculate it out, that gives us a value of 232.25 base 10. If you were to maximize and minimize this, you'd find that you had an effective range of plus and minus, of about plus and minus 10 to the 38.53 power. The floating point unit on our devices provides floating point computation functionality that's fully compliant with the IEEE 754 standard. That means it enables conversions between fixed point and floating point data formats and floating point constant instructions. The Cortex M4F uh, floating point unit fully supports single precision adds, subtractions, multiplies, divides, single cycle multiply and accumulate, MAC instruction, and square roots. You can see the instructions that the floating point unit um, uh, supports in the uh, diagram at the bottom of the screen. There are three different modes of operation for the floating point unit. There's full compliance mode. Uh, that's, that's where the floating point unit pre pre uh, processes all operations according to IEEE 754 in hardware. There's no additional support code required. It runs, it runs like that. The next mode is the flush to zero mode. If you have a result that's very, very small, as described in the IEEE 754 standard, where the destination precision is smaller in magnitude than the minimum normal value before rounding, that gets replaced with a zero. Um, uh, in most cases, that's probably what you want to do. The next uh, mode is default non. That means not a number mode. In that mode, the result of any arithmetic data processing operation that involves an input, uh, an input that's not a number or that generates a uh, result that's not a number, it will return the default non, meaning, meaning my result was not a number. If you do something like zero divided by zero or any number divided by zero, uh, that's that's a non or not a number. To support its operations, the floating point unit has 16 64-bit double word registers D0 through D15 and 32 32-bit single word registers S0 through S31. The floating point unit is disabled from reset. You must enable it with a Stellarisware API function call before you can use any floating point instructions. The processor must be in a privilege mode to read and write from the coprocessor access control register. That's the one that's going to turn it on. That API does that. Some exceptions here, the floating point unit sets the cumulative exception status flag uh, in the exception register as required for each instruction. The floating point unit does not suppo support any user type traps that you might write. The processor can reduce the exception latency by using something called lazy stacking. We have a Stellarisware API function call to do that. Lazy stacking means that the processor reserves space on the stack for the state, 
but it, does it doesn't save that state information to the stack unless it's necessary. ARM has developed the Cortex Microcontroller Software Interface Standard, or SEMSIS. Included in that is a DSP library that you could use to create your own DSP type functions. If we benchmark the Cortex M3 uh, versus the Cortex M4 with its floating point unit, the Cortex M4, even in fixed point code, is about twice as fast as the Cortex M3. In floating point, it's about 10 times faster than the Cortex M3. If you look at the diagram down at the bottom, for a, a Q15 uh, fur, Q15 is where we have a sign bit and 15 bits of uh, a fraction. In fixed point, you can see we're operating about 75% faster on the M4. For a PID loop in the same Q15 style, we're about 35% faster. For an infinite impulse response filter in IIR, this one's a 32-bit uh, sign bit and 31 uh, fractional bits. We're about 69% faster on the Cortex M4. For fixed point matrix multiplication, uh, we're about 70% faster on the M4. And correlation, where we're doing in floating point, we're 91% faster. In Lab 9, you'll experiment with using floating point code to generate a sine wave. You'll profile the code to determine how many CPU cycles it requires to execute. In Lab 9, step 1, we've already created the Lab 9 project for you with main.c, a startup file, and all necessary project and build options set. Maximize Code Composer Studio and click Project, Import Existing CCS Eclipse Project. Make the setting shown below and click Finish. Make sure that the Copy Projects in the Workspace checkbox is unchecked. So in this case, you saw that uh, my lab assistant put Lab 9. Lab 9 will work. Lab 9 CCS will work. Uh, the Discovered Projects full, um, window there will find the uh, find the correct one for you. So the code is fairly simple. What we're going to do is we're going to use the floating point unit to calculate a full cycle of a sine wave inside of a hundred data point long array. In step two, in order to save some time, we're going to browse the existing code rather than enter it line by line. Open main.c in the editor pane and paste in the code that you see below. At the top of main.c, look first at the includes because there are a couple of new ones. Math.h, that's the code that uses the sine f function prototyped by this header file. And fpu.h is support for the floating point unit. Next is an if indef construct, just in case m under pi is not already defined by the math libraries, this code will do that for us. The types and series are next. The series length, that's going to be the depth of our data buffer. Uh, the float G series data of series length, that's an array of floats series length long. And then data count is going to be a counter for our computational loop. So then looking through the code, once you've reached main, we'll need a variable of type float called F radians to calculate the sign. We'll turn on lazy stacking, as was covered in the presentation. We'll turn on the floating point unit. Remember that it's reset. At reset, it's turned off. We'll set the system clock up for 50 megahertz. Okay, a full wave, uh, full sine wave cycle is two pi radians. We're going to divide two pi by the depth of the array, so we can calculate in each individual piece. The while loop will then calculate the sine value for each of the 100 values of the angle and place them in our data array. At the end, there's an endless loop uh, to stop us. So for step seven, click the debug button to build and download the code to the LM4F120H5QR flash memory. When the process completes, click the resume button to run the code. In step eight, 
Click the suspend button to halt code execution. Note that the execution stopped in the while loop at the end of your program. In step nine, if your memory browser isn't currently available, click view memory browser on the menu bar. In either case, enter G series data. Make sure you watch the, uh, the capitalization there. It's lowercase g, title case series, title case data, all one word, in the address box, and click go. In the box that says hex 32-bit TI style, click the down arrow and select 32-bit float. What you're going to see in there is sine wave data in memory uh, like, like we have in the screen capture. So is that a sine wave? It's uh, really hard to tell from the numbers alone. But we can fix that. On the co-composer menu bar, click Tools, Graph, Single Time. Starting from the uh, top to the bottom in the properties, Make sure you have the acquisition buffer size at 100, the DSP data type as 32-bit floating point, the um, starting address as G series data, and then the display data size as 100. One caution here, if you come up with the graph and realize that you've tried to graph it in the wrong DSP data type, which in this case is 32-bit floating point, and go back and change it, the graph doesn't change properly. You would have to redo the graph. And that looks right. If you say OK, you should see we can stretch that window a little bit so it's a little bit easier to see. So you can see the graph at the bottom of your code. We can see that it's certainly a sine wave. In step 11, an interesting thing to know would be the amount of time that it takes to calculate those 100 sign values. On the CCS menu bar, click View Breakpoints. Look in the upper right area of the CCS display for the Breakpoints tab. So you can see breakpoints appear up where the expressions and watch windows were. In step 12, remove any existing breakpoints that you have by clicking Run, Remove All Breakpoints. We shouldn't have any. In main.c, set a breakpoint by double clicking in the gray area to the left of the line containing f radians equals 2 times pi divided by series length. So we've got a breakpoint set. OK. Click the restart button to restart the code from main and then click the Resume button to run to the breakpoint. Excellent. In step 14, right-click in the Breakpoints pane and select, um, and select Breakpoint Code Composer Studio Count Event. Leave the event as count as clock cycles in the next dialog and click OK. Breakpoint. Count event. Clock cycles. OK. There we go. Set another breakpoint on the line containing while one at the end of the code. This will allow us to measure the number of clock cycles that occur between the two breakpoints. In step 16, note that the clock is now, uh, the count is now zero in the breakpoints pane. Click the resume button to run to the second breakpoint. When the code execution reaches the breakpoint, execution will stop and the cycle count will be updated. So for our results, we get uh, 34,997. Uh, in, uh, in the workshop, when, I, when the uh, workbook was written, we got uh, 34,996. So that cycle count means that it took about 350 clock cycles to run each calculation and update the data count variable plus some looping overhead. 
Since the system clock is running about 50 megahertz, each loop, loop took about seven microseconds, and the entire 100 sample loop required about 700 microseconds. In step 18, right click in the breakpoints pane and select remove all and then click yes to remove all of your breakpoints. In step 19, click the terminate button to return to the CCS edit perspective. Right click on lab 9 in the project explorer pane and close the project. Minimize Co-Composer Studio.